بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عن جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري عن فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام بنت رسول الله قال سمعت فاطمة أنها قالت دخل علي علي أبي رسول الله في بعض الأيام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمة فقلت عليك السلام قال إني أجد بدني ضعفة فقلت له عيذك بالله يا أبتاه من الضعف فقال يا فاطمة إيتيني بالكساء اليماني فغتيني به فأتيت فأتيته بالكساء اليماني فغطيته به وصرت أنظر إليه وإذا وجهه يتلألؤ كأنه البدر في ليلة تمامه وكماله فما كانت إلى ساعة وإذا بولدي الحسن قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أماه فقلت عليك السلام يا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال يا أماه إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فاقبل الحسن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل مع تحت الكساء فقال وعليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أذنت لك فدخل معه تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا ساعة وإذا بولدي الحسين قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أماه إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك وأخاك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسين تحت الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدا السلام عليك يا من اختار الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معك تحت الكساء فقال, علي فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شافي أمتي قد أذنت لك فدخل معهما تحت الكساء فأقبل عند ذلك أبو الحسن علي بن أبي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا, يا أبا الحسن يا أمير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة أخي وابن عمي رسول الله فقلت نعم ها هو مع ولديك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء قال له عليك السلام يا أخي ويا وسي وخليفتي وصاحب لوالي قد أذنت لك فدخل علي تحت الكساء ثم أتيت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا أبتاه يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء قال وعليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بغاتي قد أذنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء فلما اكتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء 
akhadha abi rasulullahi bi tarfil kisai wa auma bi yadihi al yumna ila as samai wa qala allahumma inna haula'i ahlu bait wa khassati wa hamati lahmuhum lahmi wa damuhum dami yu'limuni ma yu'limuhum wa yahzununi ma yahzunuhum ana harbul liman harabahum wa silmun liman salamahum wa aduwun liman aadahum wa muhibbul liman ahabbahum innahum minni wa ana minhum فجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكتي ويا سكان سماواتي Inni ma khalaqtu samaa'an mabniyya wa la ardan madhiyya wa la qamaran munira wa la shamsan mudhi'a wa la falakan yadur wa la bahran yajri wa la fulkan yasri illa fi mahabbatihi haula'i al-khamsati alladhina hum tahta al-kisa وقال امين جبرائيل يا رب ومن تحت الكساء فقال عز وجل هم اهل بيت النبوه ومعدن الرساله هم فاطمه وابوها وبعلها وبنوها فقال جبرائيل يا ربي اتاذن لي ان احبط الى الارض لاكون معهم سادسا فقال الله نعم قد اذنت لك فهبط الامين جبرائيل وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الاعلى يقراك السلام ويخذك بالطهية والإكرام ويقول لك ويقول لك عزتي وجلالي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرض مرحية ولا قمر منيرة ولا شمس مضيئة ولا فلك يدور ولا بحر يجري ولا فلك يسري إلا لأجلكم ومحبتكم وقد أذن لي أن أدخل معكم فهل تأذن لي يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله وعليك السلام يا أمين وحي الله إنه نعم قد أذنت لك فدخل جبرائيل معنا تحت الكساء فقال لأبي إن الله قد أوحى إليكم يقول إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا فقال علي لأبي يا رسول الله أخبر لي ما لجلوسنا تحت هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة وحفت بهم الملائكة واستغفرت لهم إلى أن يتفرقوا فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب القعبة فقال أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله 
يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيهم محموم إلا وفرج الله همه ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غمه ولا طالب حاجة إلا وقضى الله حاجته فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وسعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة Wal Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawat A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Third night I uh, wish to extend my congratulations first to the Imam of our time Imam Mahdi ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and to all of you on the birth anniversary of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad so final night I want to personally thank you for the previous two nights it's you know it's been absolutely amazing and honor to serve this amazing community which I, I call my home in America because uh, I keep coming back so I hope you guys are not getting bored um, inshallah we aim to finish this night with a blast in terms of the celebration uh, Imam Sajjad السلام, has taught us so much especially when it comes to the form of ibadah, du'as we've learned so much from him and this is the least we can do in order to celebrate in style as we have done for Imam Hussein and Abu uh, Fadl Abbas السلام, so inshallah we'll all have uh, that energy with us that we've had in the last two days and uh, carry this night and end with a bang inshallah salla ala muhammad wa ali muhammad naray takbir naray risalat naray haydari haydari dono haath utha ke naray haydari جي ما شاء الله بر محمد وال محمد صلوات چند اشعار سے آغاز کرتا ہوں انشاءاللہ کہ مٹ گئے حلق پہ تلوار چلانے والے 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 ابھی زندہ ہے محمد کے گھرانے والے ابھی زندہ ہے محمد کے گھرانے والے نرہ حیدری اور کس میں ہمت ہے کہ سجاد کو مجبور کہے 
a lot of the times when we hear the riwayat, the narration of Karbala, a lot of people say Imam Sajjad was helpless. We have to be careful. Kisme himmat hai ke Sajjad ko majboor kahe Kisme, kisme himmat hai ke Sajjad ko majboor kahe Yeh hai mukhtar ko mukhtar banane wale Ali Maala, Ali Maala Hedari Kis mein himmat hai ke sajjad ko majboor kahe Yeh hai mukhtar ko mukhtar banane wale Yeh hai mukhtar ko mukhtar banane wale Aur roze aashur ko islam bachaya shahne روزِ آشور کو اسلام بچایا شہنے اور شبیر کو عابد ہے بچانے والے علی مولا علی مولا یا علی اور شبیر کو عابد ہے بچانے والے درود پڑی گا محمد اور علی محمد پر ایک اور چھوٹی سی منقبت مولا سجاد علیہ السلام کی شان میں جس کے سجدوں نے توحید کو دی بقا جس کے سجدوں نے توحید کو دی بقا ایسے مسجود کا نام سجاد ہے ہر سالت ولایت کا شاہد ہے جو ہر سالت ولایت کا شاہد ہے جو ایسے مشہود کا نام سجاد ہے اور جس نے بخشی ہے زینت عبادات کو ہر مصری پر توجہ چاہتا ہوں کہ جس نے بخشی جس نے بخشی ہے زینت عبادات کو جو ابھرنا سکھایا ہے دن رات کو جو ابھرنا سکھایا ہے دن رات کو وہ علی بھی محمد بھی مغدی بھی گئے رب سے مٹ کر ملا ہے یوں سادات کو جس کی ہم دو سنا خود محمد کرے جس کی ہم دو سنا خود محمد کرے ایسے محمود کا نام سجاد ہے نعرہ حیدری جس کی ہم دو سنا خود محمد کرے ایسے محمود کا نام سجاد ہے اور خود عبادت بھی جس کی عبادت کرے توجہ فضائل ہے امام سجاد کا کہ خود عبادت بھی جس کی عبادت کرے اور قرآن جس کی تلاوت کرے اور قرآن جس کی تلاوت کرے ماورا ہے بشر کے جو ادراک سے اس نے اکبر بھی جس کی زیارت کرے ہے لقب دہر میں جس کا زین اللبا ہے لقب دہر میں جس کا زین اللبا ایسے معبود کا نام سجاد ہے ہے لقب دہر میں جس کا زین اللبا ایسے معبود کا نام سجاد ہے جس کے سجدوں نے توحید کو دی بقا پر محمد و علی محمد صلوات
آخری کلام ایک مناجات ہوگا انشاءاللہ یا رب بی مارے کربو بلا ہم نے سب سنا ہے انشاءاللہ do your side along with me انشاءاللہ and let's use the وسیلہ افمام سجاد علیہ السلام to pray for all the oppressed in the world there's so much going on right now in our world that is unspeakable unthinkable but it's happening and let us pray using the وسیلہ افمام سجاد علیہ السلام that Allah سبحانہ وتعالی alleviates them and relieves them of all their troubles we pray as well for all the ill in the world Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them shifa to the wasila of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Those um, parents who want to have children and are unable to, we use the wasila of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them the purest of children on the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And uh, inshallah, we pray that all of us uh, have the opportunity to be in the army of our awaited savior, Imam Mahdi, ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I think we can definitely, for the love of Imam Sajjad, do a louder salawat. Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sent. Sent, 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 sent. Ya Rabbi maare kai bo bala ka hai vasita Jo hai mariz un ko tu de jal اب شفا سب مل کے یا رب بیمار کر ہے واسطہ جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد اب شفا اور اگر لاؤ دا یا رب بیمار بلا کا ہے واسطہ جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد اور کرتا ہوں دعا رب سے میں یا حضرت سجاد کرتا ہوں دعا رب سے میں یا حضرت سجاد یا حضرت سجاد ہے آسرا تمہارا تم ہی کیجیو امداد یا رب We have to be louder. Have to be louder. We have to be louder. 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 Have just because of dua and this is a, a munajat is a form that we are taught by Imam Ali as well a, a whispered prayer in a way I know we're not whispering now but it's it's, it's a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so really think about that and let's recite together loudly with our voices to reach the heavens inshallah Ya Rab bimare kaybo balaka ماشاءاللہ جی ہیں جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد ہے کون میرا جسے کروں جا کے میں فریاد ہے کون میرا جسے کروں جا کے میں فریاد کروں جا کے میں فریاد امداد طلب ہے میری تو کیجیو امداد ملکے یا رب بو بلا کا ہے واسطہ جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد گر میں ہوں گنہگار خدا فوت کر دے گر میں ہوں گنہگار 
خدا فوا تو کر دے خدا فوا تو کر دے تو ہے غفور بخش دے اور رحم تو کر دے یا رب بیمار کر بو بلا کا کیا کہہ رہے ماشاء اللہ جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد بیمار وطن فاطمہ سغرا کا واسطہ بیمار وطن فاطمہ سغرا کا واسطہ سغرا کا واسطہ معصوم کا یتیم سکینہ کا واسطہ علی مالا یا رب بیمار قیب و بلا کا ہے واسطہ جو ہے زیون کو تو دے جلد For the last verse, inshallah, really raise your hands and cry from your heart as we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using the wasila of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Ke bimar ke liye, bimar ke liye, tera ye zikr shifa hai. شفا ہے تیرا یہ ذکر شفا ہے ہر اسم تیرے ان کے لیے ایک دوا ہے یا رب بیمار قیب و بلا جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد For the last time, the loudest of voice, inshallah, all of us together یا رب ہے واسطہ جو ہے مریض ان کو تو دے جلد Ilahi Amin. Inshallah, we pray on these holy nights, all our ibadat is accepted. Um, and Inshallah, I guess I will see you in part two after the majlis, Inshallah, where we'll bring the kalam uh, for all the naras to raise, Inshallah. Nara Haydari Bar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salawat. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Our visiting speaker, Sheikh Weil, Brother Imran Dat, respected elders, your brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum, jami wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For the love of Imam Zainul Abidin, sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Surah Fatiha is requested for all marhumeen listed on the screen, as well as all ad marhumeen, Surah Tumabarak to Al-Fatiha. The Wash families is requested for all those in need here and elsewhere, as well as those listed on the screen. Let us recite together. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al mustarra ida daahu wa yakshifu su. Amma yujibu al mustarra ida daahu wa yakshifu su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويخشف السوء 
Tonight, we'd like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to both Sheikh Wa'il as well as Brother Imran Datu for having taken time to be with us here for the Wilada celebrations this week. We have truly benefited from your majalis and recitations in honor of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. We pray that the Almighty gives you the strength and inspiration to continue serving in his way, inshallah. On that note, let us invite Sheikh Wild to please come forward for tonight's majlis. Where Muhammad wa Muhammad salawat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأعز المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين العبد المؤيد والنور المسدد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فيقول الحق وقوله الصدق في محكم التنزيل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما صدق الله العلي العظيم آمنا بالله ورسله to hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, I request we recite three salawat with the loudest of our voices. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. When one looks into Islamic history, mainly the history of the process of da'wah, one would notice that the process of da'wah went into two main stages of conflict. The first stage, which is referred to as the stage of tanzil. And that stage was basically, re or, or during the stage, the conflict revolved around the revelation of the religion of Islam and the Holy Quran, where you find that the forces of Jahiliya employed all their powers to stand against the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and try to fight it by any means possible to stop the spread of the religion of Islam. And we all know what happened in this regard, is that that stage ended with the victory of the religion of Islam and the revelation of the Qur'an, and the religion of Islam was being spread all over the peninsula. And one might think that the forces of Jahiliya accepted the defeat. But if we were to focus carefully, we would notice that such forces, what they did, is that they embraced the da'wah, they converted to the religion of Islam, be it out of conviction or not. And what they did is that they retreated from the front lines of the confrontation of the da'wah, and they joined the da'wah and began infiltrating the da'wah from within. They began fighting the da'wah from within through infiltrating the teachings of the deen. And thereupon began the second stage of conflict, referred to as what? As the stage of ta'wil, meaning the, uh, sorry, the interpretation of the Qur'an. And we all know the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and where he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajahum. And where he says to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad 
O oh, Ali, I will fight over the revelation of the Qur'an and you will fight over the interpretation of the Qur'an. So thereupon began the second stage of the conflict referred to as the, as the conflict of Ta'wil. And may Allah have mercy on Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir expresses this meaning eloquently when he was approached on the battle of Safin by some of the companions. And he was asked as to why he was fighting alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam against Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As. Ammar ibn Yasir replied saying, do you see that banner right in front of you? And then he, no, he pointed at the banner that Amr ibn al-As was carrying. And then he said, that's the black banner of Amr ibn al-As. By Allah, I had fought alongside Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam against it three times before. And this is the fourth time, and I can tell you that this is the most wicked and most evil out of all of them. So you would notice that the pinnacle of that conflict of ta'wil in the Muslim ummah was literally in Safin and Karbala. Because if we were to focus on Safin and Karbala, we would notice that Safin and Karbala are none but a continuation of Uhud, of Badr and Uhud. And that's literally the meaning that was expressed by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam even during the battle of Safin. On that note, if one was to also focus on the historians that documented the biography of the Imams, mainly or the Ahlul Bayt in general, mainly the Imams, one would notice that the historians separated the biography of the Imams into two different eras. And I want you to keep the conflict part in your mind so we can understand deeply what is the conclusion of this. So in reality, you would notice that the historians separated the biography of the Imams into two eras. They say what? The first era was the era of, that began with Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa and ended with the martyrdom of Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Karbala. And that era, if one was to focus on it, according to those historians, the Ahlul Bayt believed that they were the true successors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and thereupon they strived in politics, and they were took apart in many political conflicts, as we referred earlier, is that there were two main stages of conflict. During that second stage, the, according to those historians, the Ahlul Bayt took apart in those political conflicts. Why? Because they believed that they had the right to the imama, such as the conflict of, for example, Jamal, and the conflict of Safin, or Nahrawan, or even the conflict of uh, the war that occurred between Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and Imam al-Hasan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. So they say that the Ahlul Bayt in that era, they took apart. And again, when we speak about historians, keep something in mind, is that historians try to be as academic as possible. When they document historical events, they're not involving their aqidah and their emotions in it. So academically speaking, that was their opinion. And then they see the second era, focus on this part, began with Imam Zain al-Abideen sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi. Began with Imam Zain al-Abideen sallallahu alayhi wa sallamu alayhi and up until the occultation of our awaited, awaited Imam Ajallallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif And then they continue, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It ended with the occultation of Imam Zaman Ajallahu ta'ala faraj sharif They say that during that era, the Ahlul Bayt isolated themselves from any political activity. And it's almost as if they were pictured that the Ahlul Bayt, mainly the Imams, were not involved in any political conflicts, is that they decided to focus more on tabligh and spreading the Ahlul Bayt school of thought rather than taking a part in any political conflicts. And believe it or not, whether this does go or does this coincide with the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, because if you were to focus on it, in the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, we do not believe that politics is separated from religion, by the way. Is that, but whether you do agree with it or not, that we cannot but admit that many Shias, even scholars, adopted this theory. And thereupon you will find that there's a split in the Shia world. Is that there's a group of people and scholars, backed up by their own proofs, that believe that, that uh, during the time of occultation, we should not be involved in politics. And during the time of occultation, the Shias should not even strive to form any form of government. Right? 
Because why? That a government of Islam, a true government of Islam, needs to be ruled by an infallible imam. And then there's another group that come and say what? They also have their own academic proofs and their, their backings. And they have their backings from the Quran and the Hadith and scholars. They come and say, sure, a true and absolute perfect Islamic government should be ruled by, ruled by an infallible imam, let alone Imam Zaman Abdullah Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. But in reality, what do we do in the times of occultation? Is that during the time of occultation, isn't it worth it that we would establish a government for the imam and just establish a foundation for the reappearance of our awaited imam? And again, this is a topic of dispute in the Shia world, and it, there is a split whether we like it or not. May Allah bless the soul of Imam Khomeini, Radwanullahi Ta'ala Alayh. He has something genius he said one time. He said, one who believes that religion should be separated from politics did not, uh, sorry, did neither understand politics nor did he understand religion, right? You would notice that there is that split. It does exist. Yet the beautiful part is that that split stayed in the academic field. Meaning what? You find, for example, that the scholars that split, that had, that had different uh, points of view in this regard, that they kept that conflict in an academic field, unlike what you see nowadays, because nowadays, mashallah, social media gave a platform to every Tom, Dick, and Harry to opinionate and come and speak about something that should not be even spoken of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran beautifully, <clears throat> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تسألوا عن أشياء تبدى لكم تسؤكم Oh those who believe or hope oh believers do not ask about things or matters that if they were to be answered or exposed to you then they will not benefit you that they might even put you in a, in a, in a, uh, or in a state of dispute right why because sometimes the religion of Islam wants you to be able to understand the topic and then after that, be able to speak and opinionate about it. And inshallah, we shall come to this part within the, um, uh, the, the content of the lecture, inshallah. So thereupon, you find that there was that split, but it was kept in the academic field. So for example, you find that one of the trendy topics to always discuss, that people love to always ask about, is wilayatul faqih, for instance, right? You're the guardianship of the jurist. And you find that some people, unfortunately, the unfortunate reality is that many people come and they even have discussions about it. Some have programs. Some respectfully even gave lectures about it. Where if you were to focus on the whole notion of Wilayatul Faqih, for instance, as a theory, you find the scholars such as Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, may Allah lengthen his life, has a genius book in this regard. It's called 114 Questions about the, guardian of the, the guardianship of the jurist. He comes and says what? Note, in the introduction of the book, he said, it is sad to see people that did not reach the level of Sutuh al-Uliya. Sutuh al-Uliya and the Hawza curriculum is basically masters, right? So when you go to university, there's your bachelor's and then there's your master's and your PhD, isn't it? You find that he says that people that did not even finish the Sutuh al-Uliya, meaning did not even attain that level of masters in Hawza, that they want to discuss Wilayatul Faqih, be it with it, or against it. And then you find nowadays that people always want to talk about it. Many even love to even ask the question about it. They wait for the speaker to come and lecture, and you find that teenagers are asking, oh, what do you think about Wila? What do you mean, what do you think? Well, who is wild to think about this or not? I mean, there are scholars on the level that discuss such theories. It is something that why would I want to waste my time discussing, right? Let's say, for instance, or whether to speak against it or with it, or whether to prove it or not. When, the, for example, there are different other matters that we're not even on the level to understand yet, isn't it? You find that every Mawlana has this paranoia, is that who's going to come and pick him up from the airport? On a side note, why? Because subhanAllah, in every community, the one that volunteers to pick up the Mawlana from the airport is the one that has the biggest list of questions. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. It's like as if that man was preparing those questions for a year. For a year, oh, I'll pick up the Mulana from the airport. He comes and picks you up from the airport. The Mulana just wants to get to the hotel and rest, for God's sake, you know. I'm sure he knows what I'm talking about. And sometimes you might even have a lecture to deliver on the same day. You just want to check in. You want to get some rest. Yes? I swear to you, one time, one time a person picked me up. Wonderful guy, though. As soon as he picked me up from the airport, we sat down. Even before I buckled my seatbelt, he said, Mulana, we have 20 minutes to get to the, uh, to the hotel. Explain to me the falsafa of Ayatul Kursi. Seriously, what? 
<laughs> for real. I looked at him and I said, do you know what kursi means in Arabic? He said, yeah, it means a chair. I said, wallah al you're going to end up on a wheelchair if you don't get me to the airport. <laughs> so he seriously want me to explain to you Ayatul Kursi, Falsafa Ayatul Kursi. One guy said, Mawlana, we need to pass by the Qabristan and recite Fatiha for my grandmother. So when did your grandmother pass away, Mashallah? He said, she passed away a year ago. He said, your grandmother in the Qabristan is waiting for Sheikh Wa'al al Zain to arrive to your city. To go recite Fatiha, Habibi, sure, we'll recite Fatiha. I'll even give a majlis for your grandmother. But just first get me to the hotel, for God's sake. No, so if I, <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> yeah, Allah, the experiences you go through. It's amazing, though, subhanAllah. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, qul siru fil ardi fanduru. Say roam around travel. It's actually, traveling really feeds your mind and, and it gives you a lot of exposure and experiences to different communities. And subhanAllah, so you find that in reality, many people want to ask questions sometimes, that in reality, there are more worthy topics to discuss in this regard. So if we go back to what we just said, is that that conflict, right, stayed in the academic field. And if we were to derive a conclusion from that full introduction, we will find that even when the historians look into the life of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, or even us as the followers of the Ahl Bayt School of Thought, we look into the life of Imam Zainul Abidin salawatullahi wa salam alayhi, there is always Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There is always a focus on the ibadah of Imam al-Sajjad more than anything else. And yes, though this is considered a virtue, there's no doubt that Imam al-Sajjad was given the title of Zain al-Abideen. That even there's a beautiful hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that says that on the day of Qiyamah, there will be a voice heard from the Arsh saying, Aina Zain al-Ibad? Where is Zain al-Abideen? And then my son Zain al-Abideen would get up and walk amongst all the nations. We're talking about the day of Qiyamah. Do you understand that uh, we're talking about nations that existed from Adam up until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many ubad, many worshippers existed. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Where is Zainul Ibad? Yes? And though ibadah is considered a virtue for Imam Zainul Abideen. But there is a really interesting theory in this regard. You see, ibadah is separated into two. There is the traditional ibadah, absolutely no doubt exists. And then there is the spirit of ibadah. Is that where you put the ibadah in the practical form. Sometimes the practical form of ibadah is no less than the traditional ibadah. Isn't it? Sometimes the actual form, the practical form of ibadah, is no less than the traditional ibadah. So when we look into the life of Imam Zain al-Abideen, there's a lot of focus on only the ibadah of Imam Zain al-Abideen. But the question arises, what else did Imam Zain al-Abideen offer to the ummah? Was Imam Zain al-Abideen politically active? Was Imam Zain al-Abideen taking a part in any form of uprising, but even in terms of thought, rather than a military uprising, for instance? Yes? Or was Imam Zain al-Abideen sick on the land of Karbala as what's always being said and repeated in our majalis? If we were to focus on, there's a genius book written recently by Sayyid Muhammad Rida al Hussein al-Jalali. I really advise you to read this book. The book is called Jihad al-Imam al-Sajjad. Wonderful book. And he comes and says, and he disputes the whole theory of Imam Zain al-Abideen being sick on the land of Karbala. Because even the sickness is a topic of dispute um, amongst the communities and Shias. You find that in the Arab community. They claim that that sickness was, for example, so-and-so. Something that I think, don't think it's appropriate to mention even on the Mabar. Let alone attributed to an infallible Imam. You find that in other cultures they say the sickness was that. But in reality, the conclusion that he comes up with, and many other scholars recently come up with, is that Imam Zainul Abidin salam fought so much so courageously on the land of Karbala that he was heavily injured. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he brought him back to the tent. So the bloodline of Imama does not end. Sure, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam was born according to opinions on the land of Karbala, that he was present in the land of Karbala, but it was not his time to be the Imam. It was the time of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. So even the whole notion of sickness has been refuted. So let's look further into this topic tonight, and this is what I would like to dissect further tonight. And I would like to literally just shed the light on the era that Imam Zain al-Abideen lived amongst, mainly after Karbala until his 
martyrdom, but this is his wilada. Inshallah, should, we should end with that. Um, a happy point, or a happy, it is a happy occasion, let's focus on that. But in reality, I would like to focus on that. And what did Imam Zain al-Abideen salam accomplish to this and offer to this ummah? And I would like to do so depending on the following points. The first one, I would like to reflect back on the verse that we started with and just shed the light a bit on some of the characteristics of Ibadur Rahman. The verse that we started with is verse number 63 in Surah Al-Furqan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا And the servants of the compassionate, most beneficent God are the ones who walk on earth humbly. So I would like to focus a bit on the characteristics of Ibadur Rahman since we're speaking tonight about Zainul Abideen salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. The second point, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The second point that I would like to shed the light upon is that were Imam Sajjad salam's activities restricted only to ibadah and worship and zuhud and the traditional form of ibadah that we know or no, it exceeded that and he played a very important, let alone a crucial role in spreading the message of the true religion that was being infiltrated by any Bani Umayyah also he played a role in the continuation of the uprising of Imam Hussein Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi in Karbala. And the third point that I would like to end with is that what was the most significant confrontation that Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam had during his era, as during the era of Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam, Bani Umayyah distorted their religion so much so to the point that people were literally being stripped away from the true teachings of Islam. Insha'Allah, I would like to proceed after you provide me with the loud salawats. Our first point we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa ibadu ar-Rahman al-ladheena yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. And the servants of the beneficent God are the ones that walk on earth humbly. Notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the ibadu ar-Rahman, the worshippers. These are the ones that the first description that Allah speaks about is what? Their physical appearance, isn't it? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even describes the way they walk, right? He begins by the physical appearance because some people have found so much arrogance in their heart that even the way they walk does not represent the true abad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, they say that one of the ways that you would describe a true abad is even the way they walk in public, right? You will find that Sayyidah Zainab salam, when she described how Sayyidah Zahra salawatullahi wa salam hu alayha, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alaykum, left her house to deliver the sermon, what does she begin with? Focus on what Sayyidah Zainab salam begins with, right? Subhanallah, you see, when we, di- when we dissect those historical events, they're worthy to focus on the details. Sometimes the secrets lie in the details. You find that Sayyidah Zainab begins by saying, how did Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam get dressed, isn't it? He starts saying by saying what? That she wore her abaya, and then she wore her jilbab, and then she put her hijab, and then she wore her chadar. Are you counting with me many layers? Are you counting me the layers? Huh? Are you understanding the whole notion of hijab now? Right? Do you understand now? Are you counting the layers, by the way? Right? The, SubhanAllah, on a side note, uh, one time I was invited at a city, don't want to mention where, but honestly, a wonderful community, straight up. Um, and then I remember that on the 11th night, if I'm not mistaken, I dissected the whole notion of there's absolutely no authentic narration that the hijab of the women of the Ahlul Bayt in the land of Karbala was taken off. There's no authentic narration about that. In fact, it's a big misconception to believe that. Sure, you could say the khimar was taken off, meaning that was covered. The face cover, sure, you could argue that it was taken off. And that's why you find that Sayyidah Zainab would tell the people of Kufa, stop staring at the faces, the faces. Focus on that, the faces of the women and children of Bani Hashim, isn't it? Fine. But there's absolutely no narration that says that the hijab was taken off. No, and some masaib, with all respect, I know that in the Indo-Pak community, they recite the Masai, that after the martyrdom of Abbas, Sayyidah Zainab salam herself willingly took off the hijab. I don't understand how. Right? And many people come, and, and let's say it did happen, which didn't, by the way. It absolutely didn't. And I stand by 
these words, inshallah. But on, nonetheless, and let's say it did. How is that a reason for, one not to, for, for, for a woman not to wear hijab? Because many people, they come and say, well, that's why we don't wear the hijab. Believe it or not, some group of people come and say, no, we wait until the reappearance of Imam Zaman. When he takes the vengeance of Imam Hussein, that's when we'll put the hijab on. It's interesting. So what happened to the, wait a second. So after Karbala, all those women and children of Bani Hashim or even the Muslim world, they did not wear hijab? What, do you have more aqidah than them, right? Now, believe it or not, I was dissecting, but I gave the proofs anyways. It was a full lecture. I gave the proofs and, I, and whatnot, and, and, and the argument and the rebuttal and whatnot. And I remember after I finished, you know, um, they thanked me so much. And Alhamdulillah, it was wonderful, Muharram and everything. We loved your lectures, Mawlana, but we're not going to invite you again. I said, oh, thank you so much. At least you tell me this right in my face. You know, no problem. Khair, inshallah. That's, that's what's such a wonderful experience. And they were like, no, why? Because you don't have aqidah. So I don't, what, what do you mean I don't have aqidah? So because you don't believe that the hijab was taken off from Karbala. I said, wait a second. If I were to think properly, <laughs> according to my culture and understanding, is that if you believe that, then you don't have aqidah. Then let's say if we're talking about aqidah. But in reality, you know, so, you know, there's a belief. No, the hijab was taken off, and how dare you even say that? So that's something that really pissed us off. I said, no, believe it or not, when he said the hijab was taken off, you're pissing off and you're getting angry Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and Imam al-Zaman ajallahu ta'ala farah sharif Sure, the enemies of Imam Hussein on the land of Karbala exceeded many limits, but there were certain boundaries that, believe it or not, even them, they did not exceed, right? And that hijab stayed, right? The hair of the Ahlul Bayt was not exposed at all on the land of Karbala, as unfortunately many believes. Nevertheless, Going back to what I said, is that you find that Sayyidah Zainab focuses on that a lot. She said, and then she described the layers of the hijab of her mother Fatima, and then what did she say? She said, and then she left her house surrounded by women, by the women of Bani Hashim around her, and then she steps and she takes steps exactly like the steps of her father Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Right? You know what does that mean? This is such an eloquent way of describing the way Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam would walk. He said that she would walk exactly like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa See, my humble question is, is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walked with all his masculinity, didn't he? If you were to describe the most masculine man on earth, that would be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Isn't it? So why would Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam walk like a man? Why would she insist on that? Meaning that she was trying to be maintaining her hijab to be so less attractive. Do you understand? Because sometimes the way you walk makes a big difference. And the same thing applies to the men of Islam. Is that the way you walk also make a big difference. Unless you are making a statement. Let me give you an example. You find in the battle of Khandaq what happened. In the battle of Khandaq, after Imam Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam cut off the head of Umar ibn Abdul al-Amiri, the riwayah says, ثُمَّ مَشَى بِهِ يَتَبَخْتَرْ He walked with the head of Amr ibn Abdul al-Amiri with pride. Meaning he purposely did that. Right? Why? Because there's a hadith by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that says what? التكبر على المتكبر عبادة Yes? Being proud with a proud person is a form of عبادة. Or sometimes, no, you don't, you, you don't act upon humbleness. Some people have the sense of takabur, right? The religion of Islam wants you to carry your head high. And therefore you would find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that Ibad al-Rahman is that the first thing is that what do they do? They walk humbly on earth. And then the second one is what? وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامَ And when the ignorant speak to them, what do they say? They say salam. They say peace be upon you. Why? You see, ignorance is such a disease. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam tells his son, Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Tells him, Bunay Baqir, Iyaka wa musahabata al-ahmaq wal-jahil fa'innahu yuridu an yanfa'uka fayadurruk. He said, do not, my son Baqir, do not befriend, do not associate with an ignorant or a person that insists on acting upon his foolishness. Because even when he wants to benefit you, he ends up harming you. Right? So you find that that ignorance is such a disease. Imam Ali al Hadi, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In a beautiful hadith, he says what? He summarizes it all. 
He says, إِذَا سَكَتَ الْجَاهِلِ مَخْتَلَفَ الْنَاسِ He said, if only an ignorant stays quiet, then there won't be the dispute amongst people. If only an ignorant stays quiet, right? But something that you're not familiar with, something that you don't know of, that don't speak of it. And that's why the scholars of Arfan, what do they come and say? They say, if there was a choice between silence and no, being outspoken, what should you choose? They say silence. Silence is important sometimes. Remember one of the very interesting stories that my teacher told me. You know, Mulanas always have funny stories sometimes, honestly. They, they, they travel a lot and they meet with different types of people, especially the ones that do divorce and nikah and all that. Alhamdulillah, I don't do any of that. I don't want to do any of that. I had enough drama on my plate, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, so I remember one time on the note of ignorance, he said I was, I was, I was basically um, performing a divorce. You know, a couple, they came to an agreement that they're going to get divorced. So I sat down, everything is fine, we're already doing the paperwork, and then I'm filling up the application, and then the person t tells me, uh, and then I tell him, okay, so would you give me ijazah for... And then he said, well, first Maulana, she has to agree on the terms of conditions and conditions, and then I will recite Surah At-Talaq. You know, in the Quran, there's a surah called Surah At-Talaq, Surah the Divorce. So my teacher looked at him and he said, w what do you mean? He said, well, doesn't she want to get divorced? He said, yeah. He said that. If she agrees on the terms and conditions, then I'll recite Surah At-Talaq. He said, what does Surah At-Talaq have to do with the divorce? He said, then why is it called Surah the Divorce in the Quran? He said, so you think the way you divorce someone is that you recite Surah At-Talaq? He said, yeah, that's how she got divorced. He said, so that means people that recite Surah At-Talaq and the Quran and Shah Ramadan and everything automatically divorce their wives? You know what he replied? He's like, Mawlana, don't do ghiba on people. <laughs> he said, oh, so, <laughs> so can you imagine that? He said, sometimes there's a lot of ignorance. SubhanAllah. There's a lot of ignorance. Wallah al -Azim. Sometimes we have, I remember one time I was lecturing somewhere and it was during the month of Ramadan. Someone contacted me. And then uh, they had a question, and they said, Mulana in Dua Kumail, why does Imam Ali salam do Dua against his own enemies? So what do you mean? What does that mean? And then they said, well, why doesn't he just say, I forgive you? He said, do you know why? He said, why? Because Imam Ali salam is not the Catholic Jesus. The religion of Islam, we don't believe that whoever slapped you on the right, you turn the left. It doesn't exist in the religion. Wallah al if you show me a God that believes in this, I won't worship him. What do you mean? What does this exist? So sometimes so we want to be more Catholic than the Pope himself. Right? So on the other hand, you will find that what the, the ignorance. That, so when the ignorance speak to them, they say salam. One of the people who saw Imam Zainul Abidin salam walking in Medina, and then when he approached him, he began cursing Imam Zainul Abidin. Believe it or not, the error that Imam Zainul Abidin left amongst is the most crucial error on the Shias of the Ahlul Bayt, to the point that the narrations say, history documents, that there were only few people that would be um, a bit outspoken about the fact that they were Shia. And there were only few Shias left, people that would dare to even say they were Shias, right? The Umayyad dynasty and the Umayyad media outlets worked so hard on stripping people away from the Ahlul Bayt and demonizing Ahlul Bayt, you know, to the point of what? You know, there's a narration one time that Imam al-Baqir was sitting in the masjid of Rasulullah in Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr. And then he was explaining to his people, to his, to his disciples, to his friends, and he was talking to them about the fada'il of Laylatul Qadr. There was a man in Sham sitting in the masjid. And then he looked at Imam al-Baqir what did he say? He said, anta ta'rifu Laylatul Qadr? So why? Do you even know what Laylatul Qadr is? Imam al-Baqir do you understand the level that the Muslim society reached to? Yes? Believe it or not, Medina, Medina became a party city. Bani Umayyah, what did they do? They used to import all the famous singers and send them where? To Medina. Yeah? SubhanAllah, remember when we were talking the first night about what? Historical trends. Yeah? What's happening now, mashaAllah, in Medina? History what? Repeats itself, isn't it? The same exact era. Jahiliyyah, the first Jahiliyyah, there's a second Jahiliyyah. Same thing. 
You find that the man looked at Imam al-Baqir and said, oh, do you even know what Laylatul Qadr is? Imam al-Baqir replied back to him. He said, and how would I not know Laylatul Qadr when the angels of the Rahman and the Arsh descend and they circumambulate around us, Ahlul Bayt, on that night? Yeah. So could you imagine that? You know, to the point, to the point, you see, Muawiyah convinced the people of Sham um, that Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, has so many vices to the point that there was a man from Sham that walked into Kufa when the martyrdom of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was being announced. So the Adhan was being recited and then the Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was announced uh, that he was killed and he was striked in the masjid. So the man looked at the people and he said, what happened to Ali ibn Abi Talib? They said, well, he, was, well, he died, he martyred. He asked how. They said, well, he was striked in the masjid in Salat. He replied back by saying, why? Did Ali even used to pray? Hmm? Do you know that it reached to that level? That's exactly what the media outlets worked on. SubhanAllah. And why, why do you think so? I mean, look, we live in an age right now with all the social media, with all the advance, the technological advance, and you still find people as soon as they meet you and they say you're Shia, right? And you say you're Shia, right away they have so many misconceptions. I kid you not, I had a friend of mine, we were friends for about two years in Ottawa. A friend of mine was doing his master's in Carlton University. Then I remember one time, subhanAllah, he never saw me pray before, and one time we wanted to stand in prayer, and when he saw me, how am I praying? He said, why are you praying this way? He said, well, do you know I'm Shia? He said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean I'm not? No, I am Shia, you know. <laughs> Some people, subhanAllah, they accuse you of something that you don't even know of. You know, realize those people, so, mashallah, they're the geniuses. They come and they say, you know, their hearts, mashallah, they're geniuses in that. They come and they accuse you of something and you deny it. It's like, the, it's like a person that saw his friend and they said, well, people told me you're dead. He said, well, I'm standing right here in front of you. He said, yeah, but trustworthy people told me you're dead. They don't lie. Well, I'm standing here right in front of you. Right? Some people, no, 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 you're like that. The Zohar looked at me and said, no, no, you're not Shia. I said, what do you mean I'm not Shia? He said, no, man, I've known you for two years. You know, I've seen you, you recite Quran. I said, yes. He said, and now you're praying. I mean, he said, yeah, well, what does that have to do with anything? He said, no, no, Shias don't do that. I said, well, what do Shias do? He said, well, at nighttime, I don't see you disappear. I said, no, that's a new one. <laughs> that's a new one. But well, bring it on, man. That's going to be a story to tell. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you Shias at nighttime, you guys climb up the mountains or you can go to the roofs of the buildings and you transform. I said, man, that's cool, bro. <laughs> I'm like, do we? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, like what? Like werewolf? I mean, I'd want that, right? I mean, what? He said, no, like you guys stand on the roof and you call upon something. I'm like, no, well, I don't know what you're, that's Batman, Habibi. That's not Shia. You know, can you imagine that? I swear to you, even now, nowadays. So that person... That person even, could you imagine that they got to the point that what? Oh, what, did Ali even used to pray? And that's the sad reality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues by saying, and then uh, the, the one that I would really like to focus on is, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا He is basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, and those when they spend, they neither spend wastefully, nor they spend stingily. But they spend moderately. They maintain a balance. There's a beautiful hadith that comes to mind by Imam Amir al-Mu'min in this regard. And he says what? عَجِبْتُ لِلْبَخِيلِ يَسْتَعْجِلُ الْفَقْرَ الَّذِي مِنْهُ هَرَبْ I wonder about a stingy. I wonder about a stingy. That he accelerates and rushes towards what? Towards the poverty that he ran away from. A stingy person, a person that might have money. Right? وَيَفُوتُهُ الْغِنَى الَّذِي إِيَّاهُ طَلَبْ and he misses out on what? On the wealth that he spent all his life accumulating. Because he can't even enjoy his wealth. He's stingy. So he lives in this dunya, a life of a poor person. And then in akhirah, he will be judged as a wealthy person. Isn't it? So basically they maintain a balance. And that was the first point of our discussion. The second one, inshallah, is what we said. If we were to focus on the life of Imam Zainul Abidin sallallahu wa sallam alayhi, what did he Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad? We would notice that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, 
he acted in such a wise way during that era. So the first step that Imam Zainul Abidin salam took, or if you were to focus on the first confrontation of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, if let's say Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam did not want anything to do with politics and he did not want to cause awareness in society on a political level, then you will find that why did Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam deliver a sermon in Sham? If you were to focus on the sermon of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam in Sham, you would notice that that sermon contained theology in it, it contained nubuwa in it, it contained imama, fiqh, it contained fada'il, it contained masa'ib, that sermon, right? And that sermon in particular was amongst the society of Sham. So for example, you find that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam beginning by saying, Alhamdulillah, illadhi la bidayatala. والآخر الذي لا نهاية له والأول الذي لا أول لأوليته والآخر الذي لا آخرية له قدر له and then he goes on by saying أيها الناس من عرفني فقد عرفني ومن لم يعرفني فأنا أعرفه بنفسي is that whoever knows me in this crowd then they indeed I don't need to introduce myself to but the ones who don't know me let me introduce myself to you فأنا أعرفه بنفسي أنبأته بحسبي ونسبي أنا ابن مكة ومنا أنا ابن زمزم والصفا أنا ابن من حمل على البراق بالهوى أنا ابن من صلى بملائكة السماء مثنا مثنا أنا ابن من بلغ به جبرائيل إلى صدرة المنتهى أنا ابن من أسري به من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى فسبحان من أسرى and he goes on by mentioning who is that about the fadal of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then he moves on to mentioning the fadail of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa So you find that that was the first stage of confrontation that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam had with Bani Umayyah. So that was the first one. The second thing that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam did is what? Is that Imam Zainul Abidin, if you were to focus on his life, he did not live in Medina. He didn't reside back in Medina. Imam Zainul Abidin lived in the outskirts of Medina. And when he was in the outskirts of Medina, he would spread the da'wah, the true Islam amongst the tribes. And until this day, there are tribes that live between Medina and Mecca that they, that they feel proud that they became Shia and they, became, they embraced the Ahlul Bay school of thought simply because of Imam Sajjad sallallahu wa salamuhu alayhi. So he lived in the outskirts of Medina. The second thing that he did while living in the outskirts of Medina is that it gave him more exposure to other communities and less spies. Because do you believe it or not, Bani Umayyah did not leave the Imams by themselves. That they were always spies in Medina over the Imams. Third thing that happened as a result of that is what? The trips that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam would do to the ziyarah of his of the, gra the grave of his father. You find, if you were to focus on history, that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam lived in the outskirts of Medina, so he can be closer to Iraq, and he can always make trips to Karbala, and meet with the Shias of Iraq in Karbala, and spread the message, and spread awareness even more. The other step that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam took was what? Was the trips that he would take to Hajj. And Hajj, there were people from other communities. Hajj brings people from different nationalities to Mecca. And Imam Zainul Abidin salam went to Hajj. And we all know the famous story that occurred between him and the Umayyad Khalifa at that time, who was who? Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was present in Hajj at that time. And Imam Zainul Abidin salam was present in Hajj. Hisham Abdul, Abdul, ibn Abdul Malik was surrounded by the nobles of Asham that accompany him on his Hajj trip. And he wanted to get to the Hajar al-Aswad, to the black stone, so he can carry it and do tawaf with it. But then what happened is, people would not even move away for the Khalifa himself. Yet Imam Zainul Abidin salam shows up and people automatically move. And then he gets to the black stone and he carries it. The Haiba is given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way. Haiba, prestige, is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that point, the nobles of Sham looked at Hisham ibn Abdul Malik and they asked him, Who is this person? Hisham ibn Abdul Malik wanted to deny him. And he said, Well, I don't know who he is. Oh, subhanallah. Like totally trying to um, uh, cover up the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Al Farazdaq, who was the poet of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, recited a beautiful poem. Praise in the Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam saying, Ya sa'ili, ayna halla al-judu wal-karamu? 
Oh, if you were to ask me where is generosity and where is the sakha, where does it exist? عندي جوابه جواب إذا طلابه قدموا and then he starts talking about Imam Zain al Abidin and praising him and then mentioning his ancestors. And you find that those trips to Al Hajj make a big difference. There's another factor that also Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam took advantage of, which was the factor of the slaves. So you will notice that Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam would buy slaves. And then he would put them in a Hawza curriculum for a year. Believe it or not. Why do you think that the Ahlul Bayt school of thought reached all over the world? Why do you think that sometimes you hear about countries that you could never imagine that there would be followers of the Ahlul Bayt school of thought in? Yes? So Imam Zain al Abidin would buy those slaves. And then he would put them through a Hawza curriculum for one year. He would teach them Islam. And he would talk to them about Ahlul Bayt. And he would recite to them the Masa'ib of Karbala. And he would speak to them about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Akhlaq. Because these people are exposed to who? To Bani Umayyah at that point. And then after that, the Shahar Ramadan that would come in the following year, Imam Sajjad Alayhi Salam would give them a, an amount of money and then he would set them free. But those people are graduates of what? of the Hawza of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, they became scholars. So they would go back to their own people and their own countries, and they would spread the message of the Ahlul Bayt salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim. And thereupon you find that, that was exactly one of the main activities of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. So his activities were not restricted only to ibadah. Yes, ibadah, if we were to focus on Sahif al sajjadiyah it's obviously miraculous. I don't think there's a person that reads Dua Abu Hamza Tamali and does not feel that not only Dua Abu Hamza Tamali is a cure to the heart, but he or she will feel that's as if the Imam is living in their own soul and speaking their language and then expressing their pain that they're not being able to put it properly in words. This is Dua Abu Hamza Tamali. Yes? Fine. So Imam Sajjad sallallahu wa sallam these were the type, types of activities that he would engage in. And then, and then this is how he was basically spreading the message of the Ahlul Bayt through that. The final point that I would like to discuss tonight, which is basically the sum of it all, it is the most significant confrontation during the times of Imam Zain al Abidin. What happened is that the Umayyads, believe it or not, not only they infiltrated the teachings of the deen, and the fiqh aspect of the deen, but even the theological aspect of the deen. People had trouble with tawheed, believe it or not. Why? The Umayyad spread what we call irja in theology, murji'a. There's a group of people that were considered murji'a. Murji'a meaning what? Believe it or not, if you were to transliterate it, literally it means the postponers, meaning what? You see, the Umayyads could not hide their corruption so much, so they came up with this theory of irja, that yes, it is Allah who chooses us, it is Allah who appointed us, and even if we did appoint ourselves, Allah can see all, and Allah is happy with it. And even if he's not, then leave it up to Allah to judge us. That the people have absolutely no right to judge us. Right? Don't you hear it nowadays, by the way, huh? How many times you hear, oh, only God can judge me, right? I swear to you, subhanAllah, I don't understand when did this spread amongst the Muslim community. I hear it everywhere. Only God can judge me. I, I mean, well, what do you mean only God can judge me? Unless you consider the lyrics of Tupac Shakur, a hadith, then there's nothing called only God can judge me. No, that doesn't exist in Islam. What do you mean, oh no, Mola, only God can judge me? No, no. That was basically Bani Umayyah. That's what they said. So only God can judge us. Is that no one else is allowed to judge us? Can you imagine that? Yeah? And subhanAllah, nowadays we suffer from this. Yeah? Imagine I'm driving on the highway and I break the law and I speed and the cop pulls me over and I say, only God can judge me. Would that make sense? No. You break the fiqh laws in public and in front of people, no, of course not only God can judge you. No, absolutely not. I'm in the, trust me, I'm in the field of retail. I've lived all my life working in retail. If there's anything that they teach you in training is how to judge people. So it doesn't exist that only God can judge you, no. You'll learn how to judge, trust me. If you're in sales, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Sure, only Allah can judge you on the day of Qiyamah if there's something that we don't know of. But if there's something being performed out in public and you act upon it, then you have to be expected, or you have to expect to be judged. On the other hand, find that Imam Zain al Abidin stood up to this theory. The other thing, or first of all, how did he do that? Is that through Sahifa Sajjadiyya. And that's why when you open Sahifa Sajjadiyya, you find that it's a school of Tawheed. It is literally a school of Tawheed. They always insist on beginning on describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to form a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to properly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the dua is literally considered a weapon in the religion of Islam. Right? The other theory that was being spread is the whole concept of predestination. Believe it or not, briefly speaking, if you were to focus on the events of Karbala and after, you would notice what happened is what? Is that after Karbala, during captivity, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, we all know the famous um, incident where he looked at Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam and what did he say? He said, كَيْفَ رَأَيْتِ صُنْعَ اللَّهِ فِيكِ What do you think of what Allah has done to you? See, we always focus on the reply of Sayyidina Zainab when she said, مَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا But no, 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 no. Focus on the words. These people are not just angry lunatics and, 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 and tyrants. No. They're very cunning. They know exactly what they're doing. There was an agenda that had to be implied and ha sorry, had to be implemented. You notice that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is a very cunning person. There was a lot of people being in his court. He looked at Sayyidina Zainab and he said, what do you think of what Allah has done to you? Right? Meaning what? Meaning that whatever happened in Karbala, that's Allah, that, that's him. It's not us. Do you understand that? Why? I'll even give you another proof. In Sham, in Sham, when the Ahlul Bayt entered the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, he looked at Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and he said, Who is this? They said, This is Ali ibn al Hussein. And then he thought, and then what did Yazid ibn Muawiyah say? Awalaysa qatal Allahu Ali ibn al Hussein? Why didn't Allah kill Ali ibn al Hussein in Karbala? He's referring to who? To Ali al-Akbar, sallallahu alayhi But focus on the words of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He knew exactly what he was doing. Meaning whatever happened in Karbala, I mean, this is not us. Imam Zain al-Abidin, alayhi replied back to him. And he said, I had a brother named Ali ibn al-Hussein, referred to as Ali al-Akbar, who was killed by your soldiers and by your command on the land of Karbala. But there's that concept, that school of thought of predestination that had to be spread. Meaning whatever happens, that's from Allah. Right? If that's the way I am, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me. Right? You find this unfortunately sometimes in some people. Ayatollah Bahjat, may Allah bless his soul, is to say that the catastrophe of one's self is to say, that's just me. Right? That many of us sometimes unfortunately suffer from this disease. And saying, well, that's just me. That's just how I am. I oh, know, as a Muslim individual, you're supposed to evolve and change, always to the better, always strive to become better. So you find that Imam Zain al-Abidin confronted that. Another thing, and finally, Imam Zain al-Abidin what did he do? He insisted on performing majalis and reciting masaib in every single stage. That whatever would happen, he would insist on mourning Imam Hussain alayhi salam, reciting his masaib, and insisting on majalis. Spreading the message. Why? Because Bani Umayyah at that time wanted people to forget totally the tragedy of Karbala. Right? But Imam Zain al Abidin revived it and kept it alive. I will end it with a beautiful hadith by Imam al Sadiq. And where he says, Majalisuna Madarisuna. Our majalis are our madrasa. A beautiful hadith by Imam al-Sadiq. So our majalis are basically a school. Not just places that we come and we sit and we leave. But places that we graduate from. A majlis of Imam Hussein alayhi salam graduates people. It is a madrasa. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always keep this majalis. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the centers that perform these majalis. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to bless those wonderful faces that attend the majalis of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lengthen the lives of the ones who always take care of such majalis. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them and reward everyone sitting in those majalis and have mercy on their dead beloved ones and protect their children and raise them to become servants of our awaited Imam Ajalallahu ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Allahumma kulli waliyik al Hajjat ibn al Hassan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaihi fi hadi sa'ati wa fi kulli sa'a. Waliyan wa hafidan wa qaidan wa nasira. Wa dalilan wa aina. Hatta tuskinahu ardaka tawa. Wa tumatiahu fi ha tawila. Birahmatika ya arhaman rahimin. Wa salilahum ala muhammadin wa ala ha tayyibin al tahirin. I will just take a minute from your time if you don't mind. I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. This is my first time in Orlando. I've never been here before. Um, but next time, just please invite me when the weather is a lot better. I'd like to enjoy that. I'm just kidding. Honestly, thank you so much. I've been a very heavy guest indeed. I thank every single person who is sitting here, people that spoke to me outside. It was such an honor meeting you all. I please ask for your forgiveness if I did or say anything. I like to just sometimes add a sense of humor to the majlis, but don't take anything personal. Trust me, I have nothing personal against anybody. I'm not racist. I just hate everybody equally. <laughs> That's the truth. Anyways, but the reality is I'm very critical. I just like to, um, you know, break the ice sometimes. It's good to break the ice. You guys have been wonderful, honestly. Wonderful crowd. And uh, inshallah, we look forward to seeing you again, if I'm not mistaken, Arba'een, inshallah. Yes, it will be Arba'een. And, uh, you know, if Hojas invite you twice in a row, that means it's a miracle, right? It means you're good, man. You're, I'm just kidding. You know, um, yes, yeah, so that's what I would say. And please keep me in your dua. I'm in need always. And uh, accept me as a servant on this member. Thank you so much. Allahumma Bar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salawat. For the love of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Once again, a congratulations to you on the birth anniversary of uh, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. And you know one thing whenever I uh, attend any majlis, you know, take an example if you have a gathering or a birthday party you might have been invited so you need to be invited in order to attend and a majlis works in the same way Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam the Ahl Bayt alayhi salam have invited all of us alhamdulillah personally for these three nights and the fact that you're attending is an honor it's a massive honor that has been placed on us alhamdulillah and we're lucky to be blessed with such a um, chance to attend to the majlis and I know that ch you know children have school you guys have work but yet the effort is made to attend these majalis and inshallah I pray that all our efforts are accepted um, in, in the uh, majalis that we are doing. Narai Takbir Narai Risalat Narai Haydari Haydari Dono Haath Utha Ke Narai Haydari MashaAllah Var Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Salawat Inshallah, bas akhri 15-20 minute. Irada, inshallah, shuru karunga char misre Mawla Sajjad alayhi salam ki shan mein. Phir ek man qabad Mawla Ali alayhi salam ki shan mein. Aur bibi Fatima ki bhi inshallah padhenge. Aur phir mein dekhunga energy kaisa hai yahan par. Phir inshallah ek akhri man qabad padhenge. Saath mein inshallah. Let us end the celebration in style uh, at tonight after this three day, three night series inshallah. Ke Fatima ke lal ki aankho ka tara a gaya Tawajjah hai? Tawajjah hai? Fatima ke lal 
की आंखों का तारा गया के दीन से कह दे कोई तेरा किनारा गया फातिमा के लाल की आंखों देख के देख के सजाद को है हाशमी कहने लगा देख के देख के सजाद को है को है हाशमी कहने लगा के ऐसे लगता है अली जग में दोबारा आ गया अली माला अली माला है दरी के ऐसे लगता है अली जग में दोबारा आ गया फातिमा के लाल की आंखों का तारा गया मोहम्मद आल मोहम्मद पर एक और दुरुद पड़ेगा मोहम्मद आल मोहम्मद पर कौन जाने दो जहां में तेरा रुतबायाली कौन जाने दो जहां में तेरा रुतबायाली खालिक का कब्जा है तेरा याली नारा है दरी है जहां खालिक का कब्जा है तेरा याली और खाक कदमों की तेरे ले कर खुदाए नूर ने हम करबला की खाक की बात करें थे करबला खाक इज नोन फॉर द शिफा नाउ इट्स ओके बाय द खाक ऑफ द फीट ऑफ माम अली अली इस्लाम तो जो चाहता हूं कि खाक कदमों की तेरे ले कर खुदाए नूर ने खाक कदमों की तेरे ले कर खुदाए के लिए सूरज बनाया अली माला अली माला है दरी के खाक कदमों की तेरे ले कर खुदाए नूर ने खाक कदमों की तेरे ले कर खुदाए नूर ने दो जहानों के लिए सूरज बनाया और क्या ताजुब गरिशारे से दरे है बरूड़े मिश्रा तो जो चाहता हूं क्या ताजुब गर शारे से दरे है बरूड़े दिस रिवायत व इमाम अली अलैहिस्सलाम वाज इन हिज क्रेडल एंड द कस्टम एट दैट टाइम वाज टू थ्रो अ सर्प इनटू अ स्नेक एंड व्हाट डिड इमाम अली अलैहिस्सलाम डू ब्रोक द स्नेक एज इफ इट वाज नथिंग कीप दैट इन योर माइंड इंशाल्लाह कि क्या ताजुब गर शारे से दरे है बरूड़े बचपन का 
है अजद एक खिलौना हियाली नर है दरी तेरे बचपन का है अजद एक खिलौना याली पसंदीदा शेर है तो जो चाहता हूँ कि जान बेका बागर है दर की माँ जाती नहीं जान बेका बागर है दर की माँ जाती नहीं चल के आ जाते तेरे घर खुद ही काबा के जान बेका अली नर है दरी के जान बेका बागर है दर की माँ जाती नहीं चल के आ जाता तेरे घर खुद ही काबायाली और तेरे दर से तेरे दर से नूर लेने के लिए का लिए से खुद उतर कर आया है तारा हियाली हली माला हली माला या लिया कि तेरे दर से नूर लेने के लिए का लिए तेरे दर से नूर लेने के लिए का लिए आसमां से आसमां से खुद उतर कर आया है ताराली और जिस शकी ने जिस शकी ने मी समेत मार की काटी जुबान जिस शकी ने जिस शकी ने मी समेत मार की काटी जुबान उसको उसको मीसा की खुशी ने मार डाला हली माला हली माला है दरी उसको मीसा की खुशी ने मार डाला इस कलाम का आखिरी शेर तो जो चाहता हूँ कि तू बताए तू बताए बद न सब में शर में तेरा कौन है तू बताए बद न सब में शर में तेरा कौन है मैं बताता हूँ वहाँ पे मेरा सहारा याली मैं बताता हूँ वहाँ पे मेरा सहारा याली अली वाला चल के आ जाते चल के आ जाता तेरे घर खुद ही काबायाली मोहम्मद वाले मोहम्मद पर गुड अलहमदुल्लाज कलम एनर्जी इज गुड एट अ हाई लेवल विद गुड इन गुड माशा मोहम्मद मोहम्मद Shala kalam on Bibi Fatma Zahra it's impossible we go 3 days without mentioning this pure lady 
Uh, this particular kalam is a favor of mine. I'm not sure if you guys have heard it. It's fairly new, so inshallah. But the kalam is powerful. The Urdu is very easy to understand. So inshallah, you guys enjoyed it. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. For the love of Sayyidah Zahra, allow the salawat. Ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sent. मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा है मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा है मेरा सामे खुदा जहरा है मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा ये सनाए जहरा का हिस्सा अपड़े मेरे साथ इंशाल्लाह है मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा जी है मेरे लब पे बुलंद आवाज से है मेरे लब पे जी और मुबाहिला हो नबी के हक में मुबाहिला हो नबी के हक में कैसे मुबाहिला हो नबी के हक में कदम जो पहला उठाए जहरा नर है दरी मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा Every verse is ending with Zahra and then the word prior to that खुदाए जहरा सिवाए जहरा उठाए जहरा तो तब जो चाहता हूँ इस पर इन्शाल्लाह कि जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन जहाँ के राजक जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन अली को रोटी खिलाए जहरा अली माला अली माला है दरी है मे लब पे सनाए जहरा जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन जहाँ के राजक अली है लेकिन अली को रोटी खिलाए जहरा मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा हाय हाय तो जो चाहता हूँ शेर पर कि हमें भी मजदूर रखे कायम We're telling Imam Zamana to keep us like laborers. We aim to be doctors, you know, especially in our community, doctors, accountant, pharmacist, etc., etc. But we're telling Imam, keep us like laborers, builders, workers. Listen to why. हमें भी मजदूर रखे कायम हमें भी मजदूर रखे कायम हमें भी मजदूर रखे कायम जो तेरा रोजा बनाए जहरा अली माला है दरी जो तेरा रोजा बनाए जहरा है मेरे लब पे है मेरे लब पे हाय हाय निजाम आलम न चल सकेगा निजाम आलम न चल सकेगा निजाम आलम न चल सकेगा अगर न चक्की चलाए जहरा है मेरे लब पे 
बोलो दावा से ले ले मोहन जी इंशाला है मेरे लब पे जिये We always say there's a saying, right? Like father, like son. But in this case, like father, like daughter. Like we heard how uh, in the majlis, Bibi Fatma the Zahra followed the footsteps exactly like Rasulullah. Listen to this verse, inshallah. Ke Khuda se vade kare Muhammad. Khuda se vade kare Muhammad. Khuda se vade kare. मोहम्मद खुदा से वादे निभाए जहर नारा है दरी अली माला नारा है दरी खुदा से वादे करे मोहम्मद खुदा से वादे करे मोहम्मद खुदा से वादे करे मोहम्मद खुदा से वादे निभाए जहरा हमें लब पे आखिरी शेर है अब लेफ्ट दिस पर्टिकुलर वर्स टू दी एंड हैवी वर्स लिसन टू द पोएट्री इनशाला है मेरे लब पे सना शिफा शिफा मोहम्मद को दे रही है शिफा मोहम्मद को दे रही है तो जो शिफा मोहम्मद को दे रही है तबीब ऐसी हृदय जहरा अली माला अली माला याली याली तबीब गए सिरदाए जहरा है मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा है मेरे लब पे सनाए जहरा बर मोहम्मद वाली मोहम्मद सलावत वहाँ से मैं देख रहा था एक और पढ़ूं या नहीं उन लोगों ने हाँ इजाजत वहां मिली है यहाँ इजाजत मिलेगी लास्ट फाइव सिक्स मिनट्स ऑफ दिस थ्री नाइट सीरीज एंड दिस इज अ कलाम आई नो कैप्टन साहब मोहम्मद जमील डूंगर सी हैज स्पेसिफिकली um said i should recite this and it's a phenomenal kalam inshallah last 5 6 minutes of your time inshallah and then we can end uh, with a hi salla ala muhammad wa ali muhammad ishq ne kar diya faisla ek taraf ishq ne कर दिया फैसला एक तरफ ईच वैस इज गिन कंपेरिजन दिस तरफ उस तरफ तो बच्चों चाहता हूं कि दो जहां एक तरफ दो जहां एक तरफ कर बला एक तरफ नाराय है दरी इश्क ने कर दिया फैसला एक तरफ और शाम वालों की तकदीर लिखते हुए जब मौला ने जब गुनहगार का नाम लिखते हुए शाम वालों के तकदीर लिखते हुए शाम वालों की तकदीर लिखते हुए हुर को शबीर ने कर लिया एक तरह अली माला अली माला हैदरी इश्क ने कर दिया फैसला 
एक तरफ और ए खुदा क्या ए खुदा क्या न जफ का है ये रास्ता ए खुदा क्या न जफ का है ये रास्ता जा रहे हैं सभी जा रहे हैं सभी अम्बिया एक तरफ इश अली माला अली माला इश्क ने कर दिया फैसला एक तरफ इन रवायत वी हैव सिंस नबी आजम टिल नाउ द प्रोफेट आइमा दे नीड हेल्प ya ali madad they they say the name of mama ali salam look at who nabi musa calls ishq ne kar diya faisla ek taraf man qabat pad ke musa ne abbas ki man qabat pad ke musa ne abbas की मन कबत पढ़े के मूसा ने आबास की कर लिया नील में रास्ता एक तरह हरी माला है दरी इश्क ने कर दिया एक तरफ और देखे बेटे ये राहिब से बोला खुदा वी ओनो द स्टोरी ऑफ राहिब माम हुसैन अल्लाम गेव बट गेव ऑन द परमिशन ऑफ अल्लाह सुबह अल्लाह सुबह तो अल्लाह चेंज द डिसीजन बिकॉज ऑफ हाउ मच ही लव्ड हुसैन अल्लाम देखे बेटे ये राहिब से बोला खुदा देखे बेटे ये राहिब से बोला खुदा हल अता एक तरफ हल अता एक तरफ ये अता एक तरफ अली माला अली माला बस आखिरी दो शेर आपकी इस इन शाह तमाम के फैसला ये अली की विला से हुआ फैसला ये अली की विला से हुआ हुर हुआ एक तरफ हुरमला एक तरफ इश्क ने कर दिया फैसला एक तरफ लास्ट वर्स आखिरी शेर फुल एनर्जी इनशाला लिसन टू दर्स दर्ड सिंपल वेरी ईजी एंड इनशाला आपकी तो जो होगी तो अच्छा होगा मजा आएगा इनशाला लास्ट वर्स कि तू सकी फाई है तू सकी फाई है कर बलाई हूँ मैं तू सकी फाई है कर बलाई हूँ मैं तू सकी फाई है कर बलाई हूँ मैं बेवफा एक तरफ बावफा एक तरफ अली माला अली यार तू सकी फाई है कर बलाई हूँ मैं तू सकी फाई है कर बलाई हूँ मैं बेवफा एक तरफ बेवफा एक तरफ बावफा एक तरफ इश्क ने कर दिया एक तरफ या अली या अली या अली अहसन अहसन with that uh, thank you so much uh, just to again echo what uh, Sheikh Nasser said as well thank you so much for having me um, like i mentioned this is becoming home it's so nice to see all your familiar faces every time uh, forgive me for any shortcomings um, even on the translations there were some translations that i did myself um, along with chat gpt 
uh, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, but I also want to thank um, uh, three of my friends who did the translations for us, Said Misa Mehdi, uh, Zain Jafri, and Brother Ali Jawad from London. So please keep them in your du'as. Um, also want to thank the media team with the slides. They've been um, fantastic. And Alhamdulillah, I hope it's really benefited you guys. I do see when I'm reciting, everyone's gazing there. That means it's a good sign. So, I mean, I know Urdu is not our first language, so it does help with the translations. And you've been amazing. They've been amazing. You know, these guys are the future soldiers of your community that, alhamdulillah, you guys are training. So keep that up, inshallah. And, uh, and I guess until next time. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Forgive me, just to end, I think we can do one loud salawat better for the love of these three Wiladat nights we've uh, celebrated. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamualaikum ya Amir al-Mu'mineen Assalamualaikum ya Fatima al-Zahra Sayyidatin al-Sayyid al-Amin Assalamualaikum ya Hassan al-Mujtaba Assalamualaikum ya Hussain al-Shaheed al-Karbala Assalamualaikum ya Ali ibn al-Hussain wa Muhammad ibn Ali wa Ja'far ibn Muhammad wa Musa ibn Ja'far wa Ali ibn Musa wa Muhammad ibn Ali wa Ali ibn Muhammad wa Al-Hasr ibn Ali wa Al-Khalaf al-Hujj al-Qa'im al-Mahdi وجزك على عبادك ومنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا قعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا مامن الإنس والجان أجر الله فرجك وصحر الله مخرجك وظهورك ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين